Okay, uh, Niall O'Toole, as uh, uh, John um, introduced me, been with Intel for the last six years. Um, so I suppose the, the agenda that I have to talk to you about today is I'll give a quick introduction about myself, what I do on site, uh, a bit about Intel, and then get into kind of the systems that we use on site uh, to optimize our, our asset life cycles uh, throughout our life. Um, I want to talk about how we use the different tools and how the facility is managed um, and then relate Moore's Law and BIM, if that's possible, and what that drives within the construction industry. So I'm not an expert in design and construction, but I do get a lot of visibility to it. Uh, in terms of BIM modeling and the Ds, I suppose I would be looking to get to 7D, and that's getting all your information up on a system, fully integrated, click of a screen, you can see your modeling in 3D and have all the asset information behind it. We don't have that system in Intel at the moment, and I'll reference later on in the presentation a pilot that has been run in Intel around using 3D and 4D modeling. So I'm not going to bore you to death. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to bore you to death with all the stats on this. Uh, it's, it's really just take from a that Intel, or a huge company, market leader, um, 43 billion in uh, revenue last year, and we're targeting to hit 50 billion this year. That doesn't come easy, um, and it, it comes through. I suppose uh, multiple, multiple disciplines uh, and collaborations coming together to deliver uh, the final product. Intel in itself is massive, 80,000 employees, and the product we build is a 22, the latest product is a 22 nanometer product. It's uh, ultra, ultra small. It, it's like the, the length of a fingernail growth in a day, and that's what we're building. But the size of the facilities used to build that are absolutely colossal. So around the world, we've uh, 10 fab sites which work in close collaboration with each other. Uh, I suppose the, the reason why I put this slide up is just to point out the site in Oregon, D1D as it's called. Um, and that's really the, the mother or the design hub for the processes and recipes that deliver the, the, the products uh, throughout the other fabrication sites. Uh, in Ireland, we have four of the fabs, Fab 10, Fab 14, 24, and 24-2. Um, Intel at the moment are currently upgrading, rebuilding, and refurbing a number of their fabrication plants throughout the world, and are putting significant investment. Uh, I think in the press it's been reported 10 billion and above. Uh, Ireland has been lucky to secure some of that so far. Um, we're positioning for future investment. Um, I just want to hone in then on the Ireland site and you know, kind of what I do uh, and what the team, uh, the, the team, teams within corporate services do. Um, I'm actually from Leakslip and I actually remember uh, the Greenfield site as it was in 1989. <coughs> Today uh, we have a site which in around 3 million square foot of buildings, uh, four fabrication plants, uh, one or two of which are in uh, refurb or positioning for refurb, which is significant investment from Intel. Uh, to date, 7.5 billion invested with more to come. Um, I just pulled this out to kind of de describe, uh, the, the photograph is a bit fuzzy and it's hard to see, but uh, it's gonna, the key points I want you to take from this are the four clean rooms. The clean room square footage is in around 380,000 square foot. For each square foot in the clean room, corporate services are responsible for 10, a multiple of 10 square foot of facility space to manage to support that clean room environment across the four fabs. So it's over 3 million square, uh, 3 million square foot, and then we have about 300 plus of, square, of clean room footage, uh, one of the largest in the world. Uh, the site itself is 300 acres, that brings its challenges, uh, and of that, 160 are developed. Um, corporate services on the site, what I do, uh, what corporate services do is we support the fabs. We don't 
manage the tools per se, but we manage the services that uh, supply the tools. We also look at the softer side of the front of house, uh, the canteens, the janitorial, and that's more the stuff that I do. But I have worked in multiple groups and disciplines uh, within the site, and I'll go into that in a bit, little bit more detail in the, in the coming slides. Uh, in terms of how we control uh, how we control the factory and what we monitor, uh, there's over 30,000 alarm points linked up to our SCADA and Simplicity. Uh, of those 30,000, 6,000 are actually real devices in the field. Uh, the figure is not really known, to be honest. Uh, I've asked a number of engineers, and the figures range from 6,000 to 10,000 devices in the field and continues to grow. It, it's continually changing. Um, the system we use to manage is called SCADA. Um, we use a simplicity package, um, which is a vendor package, and we modify that for our uses on site. So the challenges that we have in the facility, we have to meet our critical parameters. Uh, and they're built around safety, quality, and the environment. Uh, bear in mind that we're supplying gases, chemicals, um, which uh, are environmentally hazardous in themselves, so they have to be tightly controlled on site, which we do. Um, we deliver 24-7, 365, non-stop. Uh, and I mean non-stop, I mean non-stop. We also have to keep the place safe, uh, and no one gets injured. Anyone here who's been on the Intel site will be well aware of uh, safety is number one. Uh, zero interruptions to production. Uh, I suppose a, a one second or a sub one second interrupt to a facility can knock the fab out for days. Um, the throughputs in the fab are absolutely colossal, uh, to the, uh, which you know I, I mentioned earlier we're targeting 50 billion this year. Um, I, I can't tell you the figure that goes out each day, but it, it's, it's huge. Um, hence, there's a huge focus on not interrupting the fabs, and it puts pressure when we're designing these systems that are designed to be able to cope with a 365, 24-7 environment. So how do we do it? So we uh, use extensive systems, SCADA, as I mentioned. Um, that has really evolved over the years. Uh, if I go back to 15, 16 years ago, it required that if we had an issue on a system, uh, an engineer would have to go down with a laptop and actually physically plug into a PLC. Today, what we see is we see data centers supporting data. We can pull historical data for equipment. Um, we can log on remotely. Uh, we have engineers who can log on from their, their laptop at home. Uh, troubleshoot, analyze equipment, and give direction to the technicians. Uh, it's allowed, uh, I suppose, a better use of our man hours on site. Uh, all our engineers and technicians are extremely mobile on site, and they can log into the plant at any point and see what's going on. We also have a, an extensive paging system, which is linked into SCADA. And, uh, it's, it's a network-based system now, and it gives technicians the ability to understand what's happening on their, on their equipment. Um, also, SCADA, we can collect historical data, very, very important for setting your maximal schedules uh, and your maintenance uh, PMs, your preventative maintenance and your corrective maintenance. So we can build a full history through historical uh, collection of data. Um, in saying that, we have vendor systems. Intel, we, we don't... I suppose we, what we design is integrating uh, advanced vendor systems in, into uh, supporting our processes and recipes. Uh, if I was to mention a couple of companies in particular, which uh, I was kind of close to for a while, would be Alan, Alan Bradley and Rockwell. Um, they've made significant uh, gains over the years to achieve, um, uh, I suppose, a perfect redundancy. Systems which don't, when they fail, there's a heartbeat system which another system can pick up and look seamless to the fabs. Um, I stuck in <coughs> RCM, or, um, reliability centered maintenance, uh, based on the air aircraft industry. And that's how I see very much as how Intel, are, we are managing our systems on site. Um, reliability center maintenance on aircraft, we can't have aircraft dropping out of the sky. We put four engines on them, airplanes can fly with one. It's much the same with Intel and uh, I suppose the extensive use of redundancy. 
Um, our people highly trained. Um, we have engineers, techs, and support staff, uh, all of which um, are trained to specific levels within their equipment and are continuously encouraged to um, cross train and discipline uh, throughout the plant. And then uh, la last we have is documentation, extremely important. Um, and when I say documentation, I'm not talking about paper. Uh, all our technology transfers, which come from the US now, uh, come in uh, electronic format. Um, I remember in previous companies I worked in as a facility manager, and it would be a box thrown on the table. And you'd have to sift through it and figure out what all the documentation means. Um, in Intel, thankfully, uh, it's all very structured and is delivered to us uh, electronically. Um, in summary, it's, we ha use a high level of standard standardization and control. In doing that, we use a system called Copy Exact, um, which Intel are synonymous with. Uh, I mentioned earlier about um, Oregon. Uh, our fabs in Oregon, they develop uh, the recipes and processes. Um, and then they do a technology transfer out to the sister sites around the world. Um, so we have a very close relationship with them. Uh, the deliverable is to give us a process that delivers a product which is electronic, has an electronic function, which is common to all, uh, which, which is common to every chip, but without difference. Uh, if I was to take an analogy, I would use the Big Mac. Uh, the, Big Mac, I suppose, uh, Hamburger University, I think it's called. Um, uh, their philosophy is uh, Hamburger University has responsibility to ensure that every burger throughout the world in the McDonald's chain is the same, has the same taste, consistency, and product quality. Much the same for Intel and it, in, in terms of our product functionality. Um, just on a copy exact um, and people, it's actually possible for technicians on the Ireland plant to fly over to the US, land on the ground, hit the ground running, and be, walk in and manage, uh, manage and utilize the equipment on the Oregon plants. That's how precise uh, copy exact is. The documentation is delivered to us very, very much, 90% of it uh, is the same or exactly the same as what it is in Oregon. So what does that give us? It gives us cost-effective and competitive running of plant, a high level of monitoring control, and a very high level of customer satisfaction, and high performance across multiple systems. So the supported areas, we have um, ultra-pure water, industrial wastewater, we have subfab, chemicals, gases, life safety systems, so on and so forth. Absolutely massive range of equipment. And then the systems that we use to sustain them uh, would be SCADA, Maximo, Document Storage, uh, Facility Work Request Systems, and Fusion, and SWOT. Um, so I just need to get a drink. Sorry about that. So uh, SCADA I've already described. Um, to me, it's the, the heart of the factory. Uh, it lets us know what's going on. It can help us predict what's going to happen uh, through trending uh, of historical data. We use uh, PEMS point control, statistical control, spec control. Uh, it's, it's all there for us. Our technicians, engineers are all versed in it. Uh, Maximo allows for our maintenance scheduling. Our document storage is linked to Maximo for job plans and uh, standard work instructions that the uh, technicians can use. The work request system is a system that allows for um, projects, mainly capital funded items, um, for design and construction. And I'm sure there's people in here that would be familiar with the uh, facility work request system. Um, but it, it's, it's a system that kind of we can collect data, put in, the, put in for designs, and then go for this con con construction. And the FWR system is used to track that. Uh, 
Fusion uh, is used for our daily pass downs. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an off-the-shelf application, but absolutely critical on site for us. Um, it, it's used throughout the plant and in all the disciplines that I've named on the left-hand side. And then uh, our SWAT system is our Swift Works Actions team, so it's small jobs that need to be done in a hurry. Um, we'll use a system like that. So all these systems are available. They're, they're kind of heart of what I work in, and they're absolutely <coughs> key and instrumental in managing the system on site. I've stuck in uh, this guy, a uh, bit of a, a contradiction. Um, and this is Homer when he was um, facility plant manager, one of his many roles in, in, throughout the series. Uh, we may laugh at Homer, I don't relate myself to Homer, although my four-year-old, when I explain my job to my four-year-old, this is what he'll tell you what I do. Um, but to quote Homer, who thought a nuclear power plant could be so complicated? All of what I described is probably a bit overwhelming, and it's actually very difficult to get it out in uh, 10 or 12 slides in 20 minutes. That in itself is a challenge. So I'm just trying to give a holistic overview. But it is possible to break these down. You don't have to be a huge multinational uh, like Intel or Hewlett Packard to utilize systems like these. And getting into the building information systems, um, it's the data that these systems collect, I think, will support getting up into the 7D range. Now, the 7D of, of the BIM is really what I would love to see. I'm very much uh, a sustaining in sustaining mode. The 2, 3, and 4Ds are used, to, as I understand it, in the construction and design and uh, implementation mode. So maybe someday I'll see 7D, but it, it would have to replicate these systems here, or replace them, or complement them in some way. OK, and, uh, so that's Homer. Um, now, I just want to talk about a bit about the pressure on construction costs. Uh, there's Moore's Law, and Moore's Law is about the transistors on the chip will double every two years. And this has been held true for the last 40 years in, in Intel. And, you know, we've gone down to 22 nanometer, which is really, it's, it's, it's a fingernail growth in a day. It's 1,500 times smaller than the, the, the width of a human hair. It's absolutely tiny, and we have you know, engineers and uh, using equipment in the fabs, which I'm not overly involved with, high metal gates, high K gates, all this type of stuff. Extremely um, um, technical. But it's, got, it's gone to a level that it's not just about scaling and, and dimension. It, it's getting more into the innovation. What it's doing is it's pushing out beyond the tools that are in the factories. It's looking at the buildings. Uh, the product is getting so sensitive that you know when we, when we speak about copy exact, it's actually pushing back very much so now into the facility areas uh, to be able to support the product. So tiny product but the facilities and the management systems behind it are being forced to grow. That said, with a two-year life cycle, or I suppose design life cycle on this, I mean, 22 nanometers is the latest technology. There's already teams off uh, working sub-22 nanometer. Um, Positioning again for the next for the next technology. I haven't even implemented this one uh, in, into a manufacturing environment. So demand continues to increase, and the challenge that we have when we're doing a refurbs or construction is that you have the old product, and then you have the new product coming in, and demand is for both products. So it's not a matter of switching off the factory, pulling everybody out, and building it. You have to do it in parallel. Um, the Life cycle of the, I suppose it's not life cycle, but the, there's also pressure then to reduce the construction costs. And in my experience, traditionally, if you go to a contractor and say, um, yeah, I want you to do it better, I want you to do it faster, and I want you to do it cheaper, uh, there's contradictions within that. Historically, you would pay more to get it done faster. But what we're seeing now in Intel, the cost per square foot is actually dropping, and we're getting it done quicker. And it's the use of innovative tools which are supporting that. So I'm not a BIM expert, um, but I did consult with the design group because I, I really did want to bring a message about BIM to the audience here. Um, if I take this model that uh, was used as a pilot in Oregon, um, and the, the engineer involved was very good to show me this, and I got approval that I could, could show this to the, to, to the floor. But if we take it, this is underneath the fab floor. Uh, the tool sits above. 
uh, these pedestals that you see here, and then all the pipe working services are below. Now the pipe working services, gases, chems, electrical, waste, uh, ultra pure waters, etc. You multiply that by a thousand, a thousand plus, there's over a thousand tools in the fab, it becomes a designer's nightmare. And then within the design groups, you have multiple disciplines that I described earlier. Uh, tools like BIM, uh, that they're able to support the integration of those groups, being able to get through, being able to design them, and then uh, while, while the design's going on, there's actually opportunity to go for off-site construction uh, and prefabrication of pipework, etc. So how they, uh, I just put in this, I, I won't go through this in detail, I'm not an expert, I think some of the, the latter uh, presentations get more into it, but the, uh, the model that we're looking at was put together through laser scanning, uh, using the data then, uploading it into CAD, uh, creating the 3D model, uh, going to the vendor, getting the, the vendor blocks, sticking those in as well, um, and then involving the trades to put in their inputs. <coughs> the big win uh, in this one was clash detection. Uh, with all the pipework and services below the uh, fab floor and into the subfabs, uh, clash detection is a huge issue. Results in um, less change orders being made uh, and much more integration between the design groups. So I, I suppose <coughs> that was a construction pilot done in Oregon. Um, to me it's in around uh, the 3D and 4D uh, arenas of BIM. Um, the big wins that were pointed out were the coordinations amongst the design groups, the ability to pick up and clash detections, uh, to integrate schedules, and then to agree construction sequencing. Um, for me, I'd like to see it get into the 7D range. I know the capabilities out there. Uh, I will say that um, Intel are not early adapters. But the mere fact that Intel have publicly, publicly come out and said they're looking at building information, modeling, um, so there's something in it. Um, and it, it does offer a competitive advantage. Now, when I spoke to the designer in the, the US, one comment he had was the criticality of trades um, to upskill and to enable have, uh, technology enabling products that they can support because without all the design groups feeding in uh, to the relevant designs, uh, it, it will stumble. Now he did say that the, uh, the pipe work, um, the, the, the pipe works and the fitters and the mechanical were way ahead. The one that he actually pointed out was the electricals, uh, that the electricals need to come up to speed. I don't know if there's anything in that for people in here, but uh, if you're in the electrical um, trades and you're looking at BIM, uh, you may have an opportunity to, to upskill, upskill and become, gain competitive advantage. So, conclusion, uh, Intel construction products are becoming increasingly uh, complex, driven by Moore's law, continues to be, and we still see it, we still see it that way. Uh, it's costing less per unit area, and projects are being completed faster. Um, that's been driven by corporate uh, hugely. Um, we're seeing construction times being slashed by 50%. Um, hence, uh, there is a drive towards uh, building information modeling and systems alike. Um, extensive investment in control systems delivers uh, consistency in spec performance, drives optimum maintenance regimes, and enables continuous reductions in life cycle costs. Um, and that has to be very, very important for every company. Again, I emphasize this is relevant to small companies. It's not just uh, Intel. Um, Intel uh, use multiple vendor systems and it, you know, it, it's modular. If you were to break it down into discrete modules, it is modular and you can go back uh, to the smaller companies. But we need people to come together, um, or sorry, uh, to come together and use uh, advanced systems and information technology such as BIM um, to deliver ultimately um, cost competitive advantages and life cycle advantages. Okay.
Thank you, uh, Niall. You have another one or two minutes' work to do. Um, does anybody have any immediate questions? We will have a general question session at the end of the four presentations, but is there anybody who wants to ask any clarifying point here? Yes, there we are. Sorry, sorry uh, I, I was just testing your voice. I think we have to go with the microphone. I Just wondering, have you guys deployed mobile or handheld solutions for your technicians in the field or in the fabs? Or are they going to have a laptop or a desktop terminal to, to access the systems? That's a very good question. Um, no, going mobile in the field, uh, coming away from desktops, um, that's where I see it going. I have brought in from, from vendors for myself in my areas, and in particular um, RFID and the use of it, uh, extremely powerful. Um, if I can get uh, the handheld devices, uh, the 3G and the 4G are being piloted on site as well, um, which goes to your question. But I, I would kind of expand that, expand that into uh, the use of RFID as well. Uh, if, I, if I take the front of house, we have four and a half thousand people in the front of house. Um, furniture is a big issue, and RFID technology has come down low enough and been cost effective enough that we can stick an RFID tag to a chair, walk in, have a, a technician walk in with a held, handheld device, press a button and tell you how many chairs is in the building. You're then able to build a profile behind the chairs, which helps you um, predict your capital funding. For the equipment out back, yes, we, we are looking at uh, push to talk. There is um, there's push to, there's technology like Tetra, um, and there's very, uh, Tetra, I think, is one. I, I can't remember. Tetra is the, the one that comes springs to mind. Uh, we're not implementing that on site, uh, but uh, there is similar solutions that we're looking at. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll take uh, one more question, if there is one. Sorry, Alan, down here in the front yeah. row. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, what percentage of the Intel factory has been modelled in 3D? I can only comment on the site in Oregon. Uh, as I say, it's a, it's a pilot that was run. Um, the outcome from that pilot um, as to whether it will be extensively used, I would say pretty low at the moment because it was a pilot, but it is planned uh, to go further. How far, I don't actually know. Uh, I wouldn't be able to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, well done. Thank you. Thanks, folks. So